up. Get up. Get up. Enter in, Almighty God. Enter into this building and enter into our life. Be my guide in this hour and all this day and forevermore. And never let me stray from your side. Amen. May be seated. As we turn to a time of prayer, uh, some things to be of note. Uh, continued prayers for Connie Pyle after a fall uh, for healing. Uh, prayers for Sarah Clark's friend Sandra and family. And uh, prayers for Sarah Schultz uh, for healing, Virginia Simmering's daughter. Uh, prayers for Kathy Largent for healing as well. Uh, as we go into our time of prayer, you'll have an opportunity to lift up those things that continue to be on your heart. And uh, to each of those, we will respond, Lord, hear our prayer. Let's turn to God with our prayers this day. Almighty God, you set into motion creation at the mere thought, at the spoken word. And since then, transformation and change has been part of our everyday lives. You are a God of changing seasons, changing lives. A timeless nature moves from day to day to day. And yet you hold all things in your hand. We turn to you in these times of change, transition that are taking place in our lives, in our churches, everything about us. For you are the constant. You are always steadfast, and your nature does not change. Following the way of Christ, lifting up our concerns, our praises, the example that he taught, sharing with you all that is on our hearts, asking for it in your name. Standing back and watching in faith, your hand moves, continues to make change in our midst. We have lifted up those places where we seek to see your spirit. To those we add these that remain on our hearts and we name one by one. Lord, hear our prayer. 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 Turn these things over to you. We watch for your hand to be at work. 
fill us with your spirit as we continue in our faithful steps of discipleship. As we follow in the path of Jesus, we reach out to those around us seek to be the miracle you have brought into the world. In all things, you have made us co-creators, authors of our own lives, our own destinies. Help us to have discernment and strength for the path that lays before all things continue to guide us that we might be your hands and feet in the world continuing in every endeavor to build your kingdom in this place and in this time and so too to fulfill the words Jesus taught us to pray our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite the children to come forward. Good morning. How are you today? My kitty cat, huh? I want you to stand up for a second and look out there and tell me what do you see? People. People. What else do you see? Pews. Pews. Anything else? A what? Uh huh. The whole church. Okay. Do you see? Do you see any miracles? No. No. Who here is a miracle? I got 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 about half. A little more than half. That's all right. Did you see all those hands? Yes. Do you think that they're miracles? Uh, what is a miracle? You don't know. Well, there we go. How about if you do something really special and help other people and show Jesus' love to somebody else? Right? You know what? That's a miracle. Because we're sharing Jesus' love with somebody else. And that's the only way sometimes they ever see Jesus' love. There you go. Mommy said you're a miracle too. Imagine that. Did you know that? No. no. <laughs> well, the big thing that we want to remember today is that everybody has a chance to be a miracle for God and share Jesus' love with other people that we meet, with brothers and sisters and mommies and daddies and grandparents and aunts and uncles and friends and fellow people at the playground and anyone else that you happen to meet. We can show Jesus' love to everybody, right? That's right, like the friend that you made. And everyone here has the opportunity to be that same miracle. So everyone raise your hand. And remember that you, too, are a miracle. So tomorrow morning, when you get up, when you all get up and you look yourself in the mirror, she won't? No. Okay. Well, wherever she is, she can do it there too because we can all get up, look in the mirror, and remember ourselves, you are a miracle. All right? Can you remember to do that? Okay. Let's pray. 
Dear God, we thank you for the ways in which we share your love out into the world. And in that way, you make us all miracles of your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. a widow, a large crowd from the city was with her. When he saw her, the Lord had compassion for her and said, Don't cry. He stepped forward and touched the stretcher on which the dead man was being carried. Those carrying him stood still. Jesus said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother, awestruck, everyone praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding region. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you. Let us pray. I lift mine eyes into the hills, whence cometh my help. My help is in the name of the Lord, who makes heaven and earth. Grant blessing on this time spent, that the words spoken and the words heard might be one and the same. Spoken and heard, they will be pleasing in your sight. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor. And let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. Zechariah 7 to 10. 7, 10. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. Isaiah 1, 17. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. Psalm 68, 5. At the end of every three years, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in the same year and lay it up within your towns. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, or within your towns, shall come and eat and be filled, that the Lord your God may bless you in the work of your hands that you do. Deuteronomy 14, 28-29. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them, then they will cry out to me, and I will surely hear their cry. My wrath will burn, and I will kill you with the sword. And your wives shall become widows, and your children fatherless. Exodus 22, 22 to 24. And he sat down opposite the treasurer and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which together made one penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor woman 
has put in more than any of those others are contributing in the offering box. For they all contribute out of their abundance. But out of her poverty, she has put in everything she had and all she had to live on. Mark 12, 41 to 44. Get the point? God has a real special place in his heart for the widow. So Jesus and his crowd encounter a funeral procession, both trying to go through the city gate at the same time. Awkward. As the two groups stare at each other, waiting to see which will give the other the right of way, Jesus gains an understanding of what he is witnessing. How do you know? How do you know? All those minute details, the widow, her only son. We could say that Jesus is part of a triune deity and the divine nature of Christ is able to discern the thoughts of others from afar. Or he's just astute in the same way that various TV sleuths are able to look at the scene and pick up on all the little clues that hone in close and sharp those fine-tuned extrasensory abilities. Yeah, we could say that. Everyone would be satisfied. How about this? He asked, He took the time to ask, comfort a grieved widow that he encountered. Luke and all of us, for that matter, want to make it some miraculous moment of understanding to shortcut the occasion. Because somehow that makes it more magical, more miraculous. But I dare say that it's much more miraculous and magical to tell you the whole story. That the God of all creation and the person of Jesus Christ encountered this grieving widow, processing the body of her one beloved son out to its final resting place. And he stopped and he took the time to hear her story. took the time to actually listen. Took the time to be moved with compassion. Because that's what we need in some regards to the story. To learn that we need to react in the same way as Christ. Take the time out of the busyness. Spend it. In this day and age, we want to treat everything in life like a 30-minute sitcom that we climb onto that jet plane that's flying across the country, and then we cut to commercial, and four minutes later, the plane lands at some faraway destination, and we walk off, not spending any of the three to five hours that it really took to make the transit. After all, making those small relationships strangers on a plane don't add to the bigger story, right? And yet, it's one of the ways in which we actually can invest and relate with other people. Lesson one from this text, one of the biggest miracles making time to make relationship with other people has meaning and purpose to what Jesus actually did. 
what he calls us to do as Christians. The thing we remember from our studies of ancient cultures of really any and all kinds that widows cared for first and foremost by their sons, specifically their oldest sons, what makes the Old Testament story of Ruth so enduring that we remember Ruth, a foreigner, in the midst of Jesus' genealogy. If you remember, Ruth was from Moab. Well, she actually lived in Moab, and that's where we find her when Naomi and her family move to Moab. Naomi has two grown sons, one of which marries Ruth. Ruth's husband has a brother who also marries a woman from Moab. We get both of their names, but we don't really have a direct connection as to which one married which. And it's not that it matters greatly to the story because in 10 years' time, both brothers are dead. Naomi is left a widow with no sons in a foreign land. Naomi is determined to set off back to her homeland, Canaan, during the time of the judges, during the time when the Hebrew people lived in their loose tribal communities. Both women, her daughter-in-laws, vow to go with her, but she tells them, no, no. Stay in your homeland amongst your own people. You're both young. You'll remarry. But Ruth makes a solemn vow that she will stay with Naomi. That Naomi's land will be Ruth's land and Naomi's people will be Ruth's people. As they travel back to Canaan, Naomi proves to be a real pain in the, well, she turns out to be a classic mother-in-law. But Ruth lives up to her vow and her promise, caring for both their needs, ensuring they both make it back to Naomi's family. Such are the needs of a widow. Then Ruth is a widow too, huh? Our widow that Jesus encounters has no Ruth with her. She no longer has a son to care for her. And while there seems to be a large crowd of mourners, it does not appear that any of them, any of them, are there to provide for her. Jesus, moved by compassion, calls for the son. Get up. Now, unless you think raising people from the dead is a huge, miraculous thing, it wasn't so dramatic in our Old Testament scriptures. It happened over and over and over again. The 11th chapter of John gives us the dramatic story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Having been in the tomb for a few days, wrapped in linen cloths like a mummy, he emerges from the tomb under his own power, And the story goes that no one screamed or was scared. Jairus' daughter is raised from the dead. Matthew chapter 9, Mark chapter 5, Luke chapter 8. She's not yet in the tomb, but the whole village knew that she was dead and is mourning her death. And it's not just the gospel stories. It happens in the Old Testament too. In fact, in our scriptures, Nine different people are raised from the dead in the Bible. The first is found in 1 Kings 17, where Elisha, the prophet, raises the son of, oh goodness, there's a name, Zarephath, a widow. The next two are found in 2 Kings, where Elisha, the prophet, raises the son of a Shumanite woman, and the old, dead, dry bones of an unidentified man. 
Then even on the other side of the New Testament, as we move into the book of Acts, both Peter and Paul have the opportunity to raise people from the dead. For Peter, it's Dorcas, a faithful member of the church that Peter is there visiting. For Paul, it's Euctus, who fell out of the second story window. Well, we do have to point out that Paul was preaching and he fell asleep and fell out the window. There's a lesson there, I think. But we won't get into that. So why don't we still see it happening? People raising up from the dead all over the place. Well, I guess if you go to YouTube, you can actually find videos purportedly of that occurrence happening, generally out of third world countries. I wouldn't give much credibility to them. But I think the real miracle is in what we have already witnessed here in this sanctuary and through this church on numerous occasions. The power of prayer and the miracles that can be done through them. Unexplained healings that are nothing short of miraculous. But not on every occasion. God's providence comes and goes at God's whims and wills. So to me, it's more about sharing the places, sharing the stories where very human people do very extraordinary things and make a powerful witness to the work and the will and the Christian nature and the ways that we can all be miracles in other people's lives that is just as dramatic as the raising of the dead. Anyone else here a NASCAR fan? Anyone going to go watch them turn left today? No, oh, left and right because it's a road course. Jamie is actually the NASCAR fan in our family. She grew up on a small quarter-mile dirt track in Medford, Oregon, where her father raced cars and was a mechanic for cars, and she learned to count by laps and car numbers. She learned colorful adjectives that she wasn't allowed to say. Such is a life in the pit. I, on the other hand, am a baseball fan. No comment there, huh? Yeah, we suffer along with the Reds. But in the course of the safety and sanctity of my marriage, I have become a NASCAR fan. I aligned myself originally with the tribe of number 20, back when Tony Stewart drove that car. Today I'm more a track house racing fan, primarily following Daniel Suarez. What can I say? I like the underdog. But anyone who follows the sport knows that recently we've gotten into the habit of reckless, aggressive driving. And depending on your particular driver, if he is the one accused of doing the driving, which makes it aggressive, or your driver being the victim of the driving, which makes it reckless. We have seen drivers suspended of late, long after races, because of the driving that has been taking place. It wasn't always that way. All this is set up what I think is one of the most remarkable things that has ever happened in professional sports 10 years ago. Denny Hamlin drives the number 11 FedEx Toyota for Joe Gibbs Racing. March of 2013, on the last lap of a race, Denny was involved in a terrible wreck that left him with a compound fracture of his L1 vertebrae in his back. 
He was cleared to go back to racing on May 1st, 2013, Talladega Motor Speedway. Now anyone that follows the sport knows that that is one of the biggest, fastest racetracks that NASCAR races on. Two miles long at speeds well over 200 miles an hour, even 10 years ago. Cars tend to bounce around like pinballs against the wall and against each other. And it's not a matter of if there will be a wreck. It's when the wreck will occur. And those wrecks are always the biggest, hardest, and the ones where people really get hurt. Conventional wisdom would say that someone with a broken back has no business getting into a car to run the race at Talladega. However, NASCAR has a provision. That if you start the race, then someone else can get into the car after the first lap, and the original driver will accumulate the points that that car makes in the course of the race. Denny Hamlin is a driver who aspires to win a championship. He's regularly up in that top 10. And so it was important for him, his crew, the shop he represents, his sponsors, everyone who makes money off of a NASCAR team, Denny Hamlin, get into that race car on that day. The plan was that he would get in, he'd drive until the first caution flag or the first pit stop. Then he'd get out of the car and a replacement driver would jump into the car and the points that were gained would go against his name. So as they were starting up the race, the field taking the warm-up laps before the green flag. Denny Hamlin dropped to the back of the field so that he could drive a little bit slower and stay out of harm's way. Now that's all well and good, but this is the point where I took notice. Because suddenly, the number 20 car of Tony Stewart also dropped out of line. Move to the back of the pack. This happens regularly because after you qualify for a race, if you do anything to the car, then as a penalty, you have to start at the back of the field. But that's something well known. And everyone knows who has to go to the back of the field because of a penalty going into the race. And that hadn't happened to Tony Stewart or his team. He just dropped out of formation and went to the back of the field. One of the announcers commented that Tony had told him before the race that he was going to do this so he could keep an eye on his buddy. As the lap started to mount towards the green flag, they were joined in the back by two other cars. So when the green flag dropped, out in front was Michael Waltrip. To the inside of Denny Hamlin was Juan Pablo Montoya. And bringing up the rear was Tony Stewart. Four cars that rode in that formation at whatever speed Denny felt comfortable in at the back of the pack, risking their opportunity to be in the winner's circle for as long as it would take for the first caution or the first pit stop. I've never seen it happen since. I've never seen another sport where the other team has taken that much of a penalty just to ensure that one of their own stays safe. 
especially in a macho driver take all sport like NASCAR. But then again, it is the only sport where before they play the national anthem, they say a prayer. Lesson number two from this text. No matter who you are, it's never a bad thing to publicly point out or to be the miracles that happen in our world, be they big or be they small. Here endeth the lesson. Amen. Will the ushers come forward? Amen.
the image of God, redeemed by the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, guided and protected by his Holy Spirit, prepared to face the trials of tomorrow. Amen.